Thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to present um, uh, today in this meeting. Uh, and my talk will, as you can see, will, uh, will focus on the description of, of a new natural history study that we are developing uh, in our centre, the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, United Kingdom. As you know, management and treatment that we can offer to patients with rare congenital myopathies has greatly improved over the last year. We have international standards of care and also availability of family guides that allow a more proactive management, a better respiratory and cardiac care for patients. And overall, this has improved the care that we can provide uh, to families. However, unfortunately, there is no cure yet for patients and the road to therapies appears still quite uh, complex and this is really um, a complex uh, coordination of offering genetic diagnosis for all patients, clarify epidemiology by developing registries which often for very rare diseases might be more complex. We have to clarify natural history and allow deep phenotyping uh, and develop genotype phenotype correlation and deep phenotyping very often also needs to rely on imaging. Define the best outcome measures uh, that are specific for the disease of interest. Uh, then go into preclinical studies um, and, and clearly because these conditions are rare, a global approach are often needed to develop clinical trials in order to develop treatments and arrive with our in, in our you know road to therapies to a goal so as you can see this is very complex um, and often what we really are lacking for many of these rare diseases is the clarification of the natural history and in-depth knowledge of um, every nuances of the phenotype including outcome measures and biomarkers such as imaging that are needed to arrive to a treatment opportunity for the condition so just to focus a little bit more on natural history, first of all, let's understand wh what it is and why do we need natural history studies. So what is the definition of a natural history? So the natural history of a disease is the course that it takes the disease in the absence of any intervention on individuals affected by the disease up from the disease onset until the disease resolution or death. Now, there are many factors that can impact the natural history, such as, for, the, for example, age, the genetic background, environmental factors, so that's why, for example, where we live, the environment, uh, what we eat, or environmental factors that we are exposed to, the standards of care that patients uh, receive, and medications that they take. So all this factor has greatly impacted natural history. And if we look at Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example, that you might know is one of the most common form of muscular dystrophies, over the years, natural history has greatly changed. And despite the fact that we don't have a cure yet, we now see that with the application of best standards of care and some medications, such as for the heart or steroids, the natural history has greatly changed and the course of disease is different compared to what it was, for example, in the 90s or, or, or later on. So all these factors can change the natural history. And why do we need much natural histories for rare diseases? Um, because the quantitative, so really the deep understanding of the natural history can help us to counsel patients, anticipate, what could be the burden in the future and give opportunities for treatment, support the development of the best interventions. So if we know that, for example, around the age of 10, this such and such complication might happen, or maybe later when you are adult, you can anticipate um, these events and perhaps put some interventions in place, perhaps not to uh, prevent completely the occurrence of these events, but perhaps slow down the course of the disease but can also inform us, um, inform future clinical studies about, for example, what endpoint of the disease you want to choose, what is the statistical variability of the disease. So, for example, if a disease course is very slow, you would need a larger sample size, and you also can assess visibility of certain studies. So clearly, a very good knowledge of the natural history can help you to assess the efficacy and the safety of a particular intervention that you want to apply. Now, there are different types of natural histories and the type and the use of which one or the choice of which natural history you choose really depends on the purpose of your study. 
And so you can have cross-sectional studies, so a study that looks at one time point at all patients in the same moment, or longitudinal, when you look at multiple time points for each patient. It could be retrospective when you go back in time and look at case notes reviews and go in, um, backwards uh, in time. You might have longitudinal assessment in the past, or it might be prospective. You start today and then you assess patients over time. So it could be chart reviews when you look at the notes of the patients, uh, that are available through the longitudinal assessment. You might have a registry where you um, collect the data from patients through a patient registry, or you might have a, a proper protocol given natural history study when you prospectively assess patients based on a very specific protocol that is designed and is unique and the same for all patients. Clearly, the quality of data of these studies and the resources and money and the funds and the personnel that you need to complete all of these studies is very different. A chart review is clearly much less time consuming and, um, and it's easier to perform, but the quality of the data might be more fragmented. You might not have all the same data for every patient and you might have some data missing at certain time points. So clearly it's, um, it's, the quality will be better in a protocol driven natural history study. Well, um, well, there has been some natural history studies uh, for congenital myopathies and muscular dystrophies. The majority of these were retrospective, cross-sectional, or sometimes longitudinal studies. So thinking, for example, in particular for conditions that are might be similar in clinical course to titanopathies, we have, for example, a large natural history study that has been done for selenoprotein, not just by our team, for example, but also from a, uh, there was a larger study um, published by the group in, um, in France by Anna Ferreiro. There have been multiple studies coordinated for R1R1 related myopathies and similarly also for collagen 6 related dystrophies and so on. Now, this data has helped to understand also what could, which could be the best outcome measures for this condition and understand the feasibility and what sample size you need to assess certain uh, aspects of the disease uh, of, of, of these conditions. And when, however, this will retrospective, as I said, but prospective longitudinal natural history study in particular, if they're protocol driven, would be, uh, as we said, better in terms of quality. And when we design these studies, we have to consider some factors. We have to assess and identify which are the best outcome measures for that patient. So to give you an example, if a patient, for example, is um, um, in a condition, a patient can walk for very long distances, perhaps uh, uh, an assessment that looks at short distances to walk might not be appropriate because every patient will be able to walk for long distance and you might not notice an effect of a treatment. So really ident identifying the best outcome measures that is able to identify change once the treatment is started is the best. Um, so clearly we need to uh, use the outcome measures and, and, and assess them during the natural history and identify which one will be the best for that patient. We also need to understand how long we need to run the natural history study to be able to capture a change over time. So for example, if a condition doesn't really change in six months, uh, perhaps uh, we need to we need to understand, assess the patients for a longer time. And in particular for congenital myopathies, such as the recessive titanopathies, really six months is often too short time to see a change. We need biomarkers. Uh, often we use blood biomarkers, but also imaging. But again, biomarkers that can uh, show us changes over time and effect of a treatment um, when applied. But we know that rare diseases uh, also really rely on the need of cooperation among countries and uh, really often we might need to have internationally set up studies to maximize the size of the cohort, which means the number of patients that you can enroll in a specific study. Now, we heard already about titanopathy, so I, I, am not, I don't want to uh, repeat too much, but let me just um, again uh, highlight a couple of points in particular for the early onset in recessive form of congenital myopathies, which are often uh, are associated with early onset. Um, but again, we know that the spectrum is quite wide um, and we might have patients who present birth with contractures uh, and the weakness from, from early age. 
that might often progress more rapidly, but we also have children who present symptoms and signs later on during childhood or early adulthood. So really the phenotype can be quite wide, but very often we see relevant skeletal, cardiac and respiratory involvement. And the weakness is very often affecting the neck and the axial muscles or around the spine, which often results in scoliosis and weakness in the arms and the legs. Very often we see contractures that might be present at birth with contractures affecting the wrists uh, or the ankles, but also ch ch spinal and chest wall deformities, for example, of the chest uh, in this little, if you can see in this picture, or as you see, severe spinal uh, involvement with kyphoscoliosis. We also can see facial weakness, amptosis or the droopy eyelids. Um, and respiratory involvement that can very often can be early um, on present in these children that might need support for the breathing with ventilation. In terms of cardiac involvement, uh, in addition to cardiomyopathy that is often seen in titinopathies, we also have a higher prevalence compared to the general population of congenital cardiac abnormalities, such as, for example, for example changes in the, in the structure of the heart um, and that can be present from birth. We know that the pathology is quite peculiar and very often in the recessive titinopathies that are present from birth, we can see features of a structural congenital myopathy with central nucleation, where you can see the nuclei in the middle of the fibers, and changes in the oxidative staining that appear that are like cores and multi-mini cores, um, which is similar to what we see in other forms of central nuclear myopathy, such as, for example, in those associated with our one gene mutation. Genetically, these conditions are very complex. Uh, we often have truncating or missense variants, but we need two variants. So a variant that is present in, in the chromosomes that we get from our mom and the, and the, and the chromosome that we get uh, from our dad. So both copies of the genes present a change in the titan gene. But the genetic diagnosis can be extremely challenging, not only because the gene is huge and we need to sequence it all, and until very recently this was very challenging for many laboratories, but also because there are a high number of variants. So even if I sequence the titan gene in a person who does not have this condition, I'm very likely going to find some changes. And often the changes are of uh, unclear significance, and I need to understand the effect of these variants. Now, the other, uh, the other thing that we need to understand is also what is the correlation between uh, variants that we find in the gene uh, and the phenotype, the expression of the disease. So that's what we call genotype-phenotype correlation, the association between the nature and location of a specific change in a gene, which is the genotype and the disease, the phenotype. And we know from literature and from papers that has been published already, the different variants in this gene can cause a very different uh, disease expression. So in addition to the early onset central nuclear myopathies and multi core disease, we also have the adult onset conditions and the tibial muscular atrophy uh, and, and the dominant cardiomyopathies. Um, so really, we, we, we probably need to know a bit more um, and understand better this relationship between changes in the gene um, and the disease. And this will help us because if we identify a young child presents at birth with a specific change in the titan gene, understanding better this correlation can give us um, a clue about the diagnosis clearly, so which of these condition is more fitting based on the genotype, the gene change, uh, which is the severity that we, we could expect with that variant in the gene, and if we have a better knowledge on the disease, history, natural course of the disease and that is associated with that specific gene change, then we can help to give um, an idea about how the disease will progress in the child in, 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 during childhood and adulthood and what would be the risks associated. Is there a risk for respiratory involvement? Is there a risk for cardiac involvement? So this, all this information can help management and allow genetic counselling. Now, full knowledge of the disease phenotype in titinopathies is still not clear. We have no, haven't had prospective natural histories done so far, but we have a handful of retrospective cross-sectional reviews that have been published as part of larger cohort studies on congenital myopathies or studies that are focused on titinopathies. But these have been uh, only um, published in, in a few cohorts. Um, so we know that the condition very often has early onset, 
uh, in particular when we're talking about the congenital myopathy presentation, uh, patients usually uh, attain sitting and often they can walk and even run. So the disease uh, expression in terms of motor function is quite variable, as you can see. We have often um, cardiomyopathy and respiratory involvement, but also feeding issues um, and also facial dysmorphism, as we said. And, um, and again, the larger uh, cross-section of study that uh, Emily Oates has published a few years back highlight the same uh, findings so you can see that often the disease course is stable, allows ability to walk with mild to moderate weakness with however relevant respiratory and cardiac involvement. So all this information is, um, is, is helpful but we, what we don't have is a, a protocol driven natural history study that could give us a better idea about the the full disease course. And this is what we're trying to, to achieve because this information could help us to improve clinical trial readiness for titanopathy. So a few years back, together with my colleagues from the Dubovitz Neuromuscular Center, in particular, Dr. Baranello, we have um, thought about help with this to better understand the natural history of titanopathy related congenital myopathies, in particular, central nuclear myopathies and identify best outcomes to improve care and management and develop new therapies. And we submitted an application for, uh, a, chari um, for a charity in Germany, Susan Starman Stark, and, to, and, uh, and also with support from uh, the Team Titan group, we have been able to secure some fund to set up a prospective two-year natural history study um, that will be run in the UK in two sites, uh, the Dubovitz Neuromuscular Centre in London at the Great Holland Street Hospital and also at Evelina Children's Hospital. And, um, and this will be coordinated by myself and Dr. Baranello, Professor Montoni at Great Holland Street, Professor Hans Jungbluth at the Evelina Children's Hospital and collaborators in particular Dr. Marion Main, a lead physiotherapist at Great Holland Street and Professor Chris Clark, uh, um, again, an Institute of Child Health at the University College London. The study cohort will include uh, patients from the United Kingdom who are affected by recessive uh, congenital type of titanopathy, uh, including patients who have um, a pathological diagnosis of central nuclear myopathy. And um, we focus mainly on children because of um, clearly our center is a pediatric hospital. However, we are considering extending into adult age at Evelina Children's Hospital that is linked to the adult uh, neuromuscular center at Guy's Hospital. We aim to recruit, uh, hope, uh, aiming to 20-25 patients, but given the rarity of the disease and, um, um, and the recruitment in the UK only, uh, appears a feasible target and we're going to assess uh, clinical motor and respiratory function over uh, 18 months, um, up to 18 months, six monthly. We're also going to arrange a longitudinal imaging, including muscle ultrasound and muscle MRI. The main goals of this study is to first of all identify uh, the protocol to collect natural history data for this condition, validate and test outcome measures that are able to de detect progression over time, and evaluate um, the utility of ultrasound and MRI as a diagnostic tool and as a biomarker for this condition. So in terms of outcome measures, we are uh, focusing on uh, those that have been used and validated in similar condition. And for example, a 10 meter walk, time to get up from floor sitting and from floor lying, and two or, and or six minute walk test. Also to going to assess uh, joint range and progression over time of contractures as clearly this condition is characterized by a relevant joint involvement. In terms of motor function scales in for young infants, we are going to apply the CHOP in 10 scale and um, the Hammersmith motor scale for non-ambulant or ambulant individuals in older age. We're also going to apply the MFM measure uh, the 20, uh, MFM 20, that includes 20 items for children that are younger than six, or MFM 32 for those older. We're also considering to uh, assess uh, if, um, the level of fatigue and the falls that children experience um, um, during their day-to-day life. We're also are focusing on respiratory assessment, and we consider having, uh, having spinometry uh, uh, during the assessment. Um, and um, we have to consider, however, that some children, in particular who, those who are younger and who might not be able to perform FEC, 
because also of limited respiratory assessment function, this might be more challenging and perhaps the need for sleep study might be considered. In terms of longitudinal muscle imaging, one, one would be the muscle ultrasound that could be arranged at bedside. And as we know, this is a non-invasive uh, non test. And we're also going to apply muscle imaging um, of the lower, lower limbs in particular. And this will be helpful to our understand is MRI could function as a biomarker to, uh, to assess if there's a correlation between the, um, the, 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 the pattern that we see on the MRI um, and the type of uh, disease expression and the genotype, and also if we can see any correlation with, pro um, with progression of the disease over time. So where we are, I mean, we, got, we, may, we have been able to secure funds last year, but clearly the setting up of the study has been quite uh, complex, and we have set up uh, to already a number of meetings to define the best clinical and physiotherapy protocol. Um, um, for for the uh, analysis for the study, we have uh, agreed uh, on um, what will be the assessment and inclusion and exclusion criteria for patient. But all of this is currently uh, being um, undergoing ethical approval, and uh, we need to um, uh, obtain um, uh, uh, review the all our patient and public involvement uh, protocols and informed consent and all the fact sheets that we that we have um, completed and all of this has been now submitted for R&D approval. So once all of this is in place and all the um, protocols have been finalized, uh, we, we, will be, we can start to com uh, opening the, the uh, recruitment sites. Recruitment will be, once the sites are open, the recruiting site will reach out to the neuromuscular centers in the UK who are known to follow our patients with titanopathies in order to be able to inform patients with the leaflets uh, and, the, and the clinicians about the study and open and start recruitment. And the study information will be shared on suitable flat, flat platforms and channels. And uh, we're also going to reach out, of course, to Team Titan and QCMD to help us uh, sharing this information. Um, we hope that setting up the protocol of this natural history study will allow implementation of similar studies uh, uh, in other countries as well. And really, um, we are open to, um, to colleagues. Please contact us if anybody uh, would like to have more information. And clearly, if patient would like to have any information about the study, please do get in touch. Um, um, and we would be, of course, happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. And finally, I would like to uh, thank you all, my coll all the collaborators of this study. As mentioned before, Dr. Baranello, Professor Montoni, Professor Clark, and Dr. Mary Main from our center, Professor Jungblut and Jenny Sheehan, um, physiotherapist at Evelina Children's Hospital, Sarah Foy for all her support, and QCMD um, for allowing us to set up this study. And clearly, um, also our funders from Susan Mann Stark, in particular, Dr. Fisher and Jennifer Bilbao, thank you so much. Also to all the patients and families who will allow us to um, put, make this natural history be a reality. And clearly, I'm here for uh, any questions that you might have for me. Thank you.